This is Brodor, and before we get into this week's episode, I just wanted to say thank you. Whether this is your first episode, and Christ, I, I hope you didn't start at the beginning. Uh, but if it's your first, or if it's your fifth, I, you know, if you've been listening from the beginning, I don't know. I just, I wanted to say thank you to everybody who is paying attention. It means a lot to me. This is Mikey Mason, and you're listening to Why We Game. I'm Brodor, and this is Why We Game, and I'm super stoked for today's guest, pro gamer Ann Richmond of Hearthsinger Games, the head bard in charge around these parts, and she is obviously living her quest life. Ann, how oh are you? Oh my god. That was amazing. I've never heard somebody else do my intro that I'm like, is anybody out there? Is anybody here? No, no, no. I wasn't shitting. Like, I, I cyber stalked you. I consumed much Ann Richmond data over the course oh of the last God. two hours. Yeah, no. You don't listen to the show, so you don't know what to expect. I don't, I don't no. hide this. I'm, I am an avid substance abuser and I am generally slathered in marijuana when I do these interviews, but I don't know you. And so I'm really, really nervous, right? Because most of the time yeah. when I have people on the show, I have some passing relationship with them. Right. But you came across my feed and I was like, this chick's got an orphan maker t-shirt. What the fuck is that? I am in. I have got to meet her. And you do video gaming videos, you do actual plays, you do product reviews, you do advice. It's obvious that you're into cosplay. You're a wonderful singer and a professional dungeon master. It's true. There are a limited number of hours in the day, uh, Mike, but I really, I really pack them with a punch. <laughs> you do? Where? Okay. So, I mean, are you, I mean, are you on, like, is it cocaine? Is it methamphetamine? Like, how do you do it? <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I, you know, offer no, no, definitely not. It's, it's all natural here. Weirdly, I think it's really corny to say, but, but passion drives me. I get excited about, uh, things and I'm very driven and I know that consistency is key. So even though, you know, most people would I think most people think that you're always completely inspired every time you make something or every time you do something. And the truth is, if you want to get good at something, you have to keep doing it. You have to show up every single week or whatever your cadence is, and you have to deliver something. And I, I mean, I know you can um, understand that as someone who makes a podcast. Some things you come in and you're like, I am so excited about this. And other things you're like, okay, I have to get excited about this. And I think I have become very good at getting myself excited. I'm a highly excitable person. No, so that's, you're, that's how I do it. Your passion is palpable. It It is. Like I said, I, I had never heard of you before, and you came yeah. across my Facebook feed, and I watched your review of the, that was the new horror book for 5th edition D&D, &D, mm -hmm. uh, where people were complaining, you know, wham or strad. And I was like, yeah. she <laughs> is amazing. So, Again, light cyber stalking, you are in just over 30? Yes, I am, I'm 35. Yeah, so you, well, cause yes. you, you admitted being older than 30 on, uh, I think it was, uh, the Lost Mountain Saga? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, so like I said, yeah. I, and, and the reason I ask age, and I think it's an interesting thing, is you're about 12 years younger than me, and, mm -hmm a decade's worth of difference in the gaming industry is remarkable to me. And I, I worked in the hobby portion of the industry for 15 odd years. And so I've seen it change a lot, but the last decade in particular has been a remarkable shift in the hobby. How did you get started? Sure. So a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, uh, I went to a boarding school in Marion, Massachusetts, a school called Tabor Academy. It was just like Hogwarts in every way, except it wasn't super transphobic. And, uh, it was great. And we, uh, I had a, a, my, my drama teacher's son, who was a couple years older than me, invited me, uh, to come and play D&D &D with, uh, him, with him and his sister. And so it was just the three of us. 
And I honestly think that they felt sorry for me because so many of the kids, even though it was a boarding school, were local. And so people just tended to go home on the weekends and live there during the week. But I was from Chicago, so too far away. Uh, and they, they would invite me over and we would play D&D. And it was great. I was just basically like a self-insert Lady Aragorn uh, with some elfish tendencies. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I really fell in love like the, the we think we played like one whole weekend. Uh, and after that, I was hooked. I was like, we have to play more. And sadly, I didn't really have the self-confidence to, you know, go forth and then get the books and then try to get other people to play. That came much later. So after that kind of hook, I became really interested in uh, more video game stuff, which I had played video games when I was younger. But Suffice to say, my parents did not think that was a good expenditure of my time. So most of my passion for games when I was younger was was expended by trying to beg my friends and other friends' older brother to let us play. And I remember we waited and waited, and those kids, those guys finally, basically what they would do at first was they would have us play Goldeneye with them. And we would be terrible because we had never played before. So they were like, you can play as long as you win. And then we would lose, and then they'd be like, okay, give us back the controllers. So That didn't go well, so we had to wait until one fateful New Year's Eve when the boys were finally old enough to be interested in girls, and they left the house, and therefore they left our opportunity to play play Zelda. I think it was Ocarina of Time, and we sat there for the entire New Year's Eve. Uh, We were probably middle school aged at the time and just played through uh, as much of it as we could while they weren't there. And then I had a Nintendo, and I played a lot of uh, Star Wars Empire Strikes Back and Ren, Ren and Stimpy. But, like, between that first-generation Nintendo Game Boy and I guess it would have been the DS, I did not have any other generation of gaming console from Nintendo. And I think at the same time I got that DS, I got, like, an Xbox and a PlayStation. Um, so there was, like, a huge gap in the middle. And I think that gap was filled with copious amounts of musical theater training. Um, but, but at the end of that, uh, I was like, it's my life. And I got everything that I, that I wanted so I could re-engage in the hobby and found, uh, much like you said, that's 10 years later, a lot more freedom and acceptance to do so. It's remarkable to see how much the hobby has changed. But so how old were you in boarding school when you first start playing Dungeons and Dragons? Ooh, I think I was probably a sophomore, um, so I guess that's 15 or 16 years old. And, and did you yeah. come from, and again, I'm, you know, I'm, I, I, I ask this tongue firmly in cheek, but <laughs> did, did yeah. you come from an, 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 an elitist, wealthy background? Absolutely. Like, I wish I could say that I didn't, but I think I, I came from a very affluent background. My mom is very, a very accomplished and very intelligent woman. Um, she's president of Girl Scouts Chicago. She was president of the College of American Real Estate Lawyers. Like, she worked really hard, um, and my dad is a, is a chef, and um, she she worked really hard to afford me opportunities that she had to really work for that she could pr- simply provide me. Um, and I always try to keep that keep that in mind. And I've had a very interesting you know relationship, I guess, with personal success and and wealth uh, simply because the expectation to to for excellence was always there. You know, it's like, we will send you to school, but you better get A's. We will always put you in the best school that you can get into, but you cannot slack off once you are there, um, was always the the thing. And so when I then finished a very expensive boarding school education and said, I want to apply, I want to apply early decision to um, uh, New York University's musical theater program, they were like, Okay, well that that makes sense given your interests and proclivities, but how how do you intend for that to work? And you know, they I will give them credit. They were they sat down with me and they said, "We will support anything you want to do as long as you intend to be good at, at it and you intend to work hard at it. But we need you to understand that your decision here is going to be a huge lifestyle change for you. You've gotten used to growing up and being able to travel whenever you wanted, have whatever pets you wanted, have access to the best doctors and the best care and the best anything you could ever have without having to think about it. 
if you make this choice, it's not that you'll be punished for it, but you have to understand that you are choosing a different lifestyle to the one that you've become accustomed to. Um, and I, and I knew that. And, you know, that's, that's just the truth. It's just the truth about the world. And, you know, I'm very lucky that, you know, should the worst happen, yes, you know, my parents will be able to help me, but, uh, they are now the ones that are like, why don't you let us help you? And I'm like, no, I could do this. <laughs> I don't need you to hold my hand, uh, you know, financially through things. If at all possible, I will always try to figure it out myself. But I would never deny that I came from an affluent background. So what edition of D&D is, were you playing then? Because I'm just trying to get a, I'm trying yeah. to get a, a good mindset for where you're at here. I believe this was 3.5. So and, you, and that was what I came back into when I later rejoined the hobby after college. So you start playing D&D in the most, I don't want to say convoluted, but certainly one of the most arduous systems, a yeah. system that I adore and no shit literally play to this day. But that's not an easy system to wrap your head around. But you strike me as somebody who's extremely sharp. So I'm going to assume that you just jumped right in and got it. I think I was really lucky that my, my friend's brother was really good at presenting it as, you know, just what do you want to do? I'll help you figure out the mechanic. And that's something I've, you know, taken forward as a, as a dungeon master myself is that sometimes people get really, I have honestly a bit of, a bit of a learning disability uh, and doing crunchy math is really difficult for me at speed. And I think he knew that for being in classes with me um, and helped me, navigate that aspect of the game so that I could focus on what I loved at the time, which was the storytelling and the crunch came later, but all I was really doing was basically getting through a multiple session, you know, one shot, if you want to think about it that way at, at that time. So I don't think he was really, I don't think I was really worried about being intimidated by the books. I think he just said, what kind of character do you want to be? And I said, I want to be Aragorn. And he said, well, you're a ranger. And then he helped me figure that out. So I don't think there was, a time in, in the infancy of my interest for Dungeons and Dragons that I opened up a book and was just like, here, you figure this out until much later. And that was incredibly intimidating, even when we did it. I think the first time that happened when I made my own character from scratch was in 4.0 and that was made to be easy. So, but it was still very scary to me having had the experience of having somebody else basically do it for me when I started. Can I pigeonhole you into a camp in the, in the edition wars when the apocalypse occurs? And I don't I don't think it's going to be the zombie apocalypse that people think. I think that only the smart, prepared, paranoid gamers are going to survive the world. <laughs> we are going to divide the earth into different editions of Dungeons and Dragons. Sure. Games. And sorry, Pathfinder, you're better than D&D, but you're not D&D. &D. So. Wow. Yeah. Oh no, I'll, I'll throw shade, I'll throw shade on Pathfinder. I, I adore them, but any, any which way. So I am going to be a firmly in a 3.5 D&D &D camp. So that is, that is sure. my flag. We're all going to get brands yeah. or some sort of runic scarification mm -hmm. to be terrifying, right? What, what camp are you joining in the edition wars? Man, uh, it's, these are two different questions because one is what do you do to survive? And I feel like the 3.5 uh, people are going to be willing to be more savage than the 5.0 people. No, we're fucking uh, monsters. No, we're absolute yeah, but, savages. Yeah, no, it's for sure. <laughs> so if it's actually about survival, then probably 3.5, even though I wouldn't be high up in decision-making in that encampment because I would never uh, ace enough checks to to have the requisite knowledge to be respected. Right, so you didn't take uh, the right feats, and you, did, you yeah, had to plan it out feats. from first level, yeah. Exactly, uh, but... I think in terms of like the actual, what do you prefer? I, I'm just going to draw a line in the sand and say, for me, it's 5.0. It's 5e. It is what I need in order to balance out the crunch, uh, to create cinematic storytelling, to be inviting to newer players who I want to make comfortable at the table, who might not have felt comfortable in a different edition. Uh, and, and I just, I, on these wings, I soar. That's, that's it. That's about it. Is that what inspires you to do the 5e book reviews and focusing on 5th edition D&D? Because &D? it's your preferred method or preferred edition, I should say, more appropriately? It's definitely the edition I've played most. 
Like, I'm not going to pretend to be someone I'm not. I mean, you've just heard me say I've played 3.5 in like a campaign that lasted six months and then in a one shot in high school. Like, that is my, my, my 3.5, uh, literacy. And then I played 4.0 for about six months and then 5e dropped and we were like, fuck this. <laughs> right. <laughs> and we start, we started fifth edition. Um, so, you know, there, there's a lot to, I guess, ponder, but at, at the end of the day, I think, you know, fifth edition for me is just where I am the most comfortable. It's where I've played the most. And if you're asking, you know, why do I focus my content on that? It's because it's what gets views. Bro, well, sure. No, that, I, no, I don't know. There's yeah, no, <laughs> no, yeah, no objection to be, yeah. I mean, no, don't feel bad about being mercenary. I mean, that's what this yeah. endeavor is about. And, and I mean, if, the truth is, I, if I wanted to talk to somebody about my deep seated feelings about, you know, feet from 3.5, I can do that at a bar with some friends. <laughs> but if I'm making content to be consumed and to become a thought leader, uh, in a community, then you have to focus on where the conversation is. And the conversation is around fifth edition. It's around Starfinder and Pathfinder 2E. Um, and it is, you know, it also depends on what uh, communities I've become really accepted in. And I've been, I've worked on a few different things with the Glass Cannon podcast and they're very huge. Uh, Glass Cannon Network is one of the highest regarded Pathfinder and Starfinder uh, like show producers out there. And so I know a lot of their fans have discovered me through that. So every once in a while I'll be like, okay, cool. Well, Paizo has sent me the beginner box. So I'm going to do a review for this or, oh my gosh, there's a new adventure on Amazon Alexa for Starfinder. And I love Starfinder, you know, uh, and I'll do that too. But primarily I make stuff about what's releasing or what I think a current co- conversation is focusing on. Um, like if something happens in critical role or another very public game that people are arguing about, like that's the time to say, well, what do I have to say about this topic? Because people are going to be looking to hear more about it. So that's how I decide. That's very good advice for anybody. I mean, particularly hell, just for me, for wanting to do this, because mm-hmm. for the thing that I find fascinating are the people that want to go pro. That's what's intriguing to me. And, Looking at the the similarities and the differences in personality, one of the big similarities, obviously, is that passion and the drive to produce content. But I want to go back. You'd said earlier on before we started recording, you'd kind of taken a, a, a was it a break from gaming? And then. No. Yeah. So so I had um this past year. So I, the, the way, the way that this story begins, mm, thank begins you. with me working at a games distribution company for tabletop games, um, and working there for about three years. They saw the signs of COVID coming and they decided it is time for a restructure or we may not survive. Which, which distributor was this? This is, uh, GTS distribution. Oh, sure, um, sure. Yeah. And, no, I, I, yeah, yeah I, I used to know a guy who worked for them, uh, before oh, yeah? that. Yeah. Cause I live in St. Louis. They actually have a few years back, they opened yeah, yeah. A, a warehouse here. So long. Yeah. Anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I'm familiar. Yeah. So they had started a new channel called Active Player Network. And I was, they basically handed me the channel and said, we want you to be geek and sundry. And I said, I am one person. So maybe lower your expectations a little bit. Uh, but, you know, we, we ended up producing a lot of content, some around, um, some content around, uh, like different releases at conventions. And I would do interviews with designers and publishers and all that kind of stuff. And then other things would be, you know, exclusive titles that we were releasing or releasing with overviews or how to plays or things like that or unboxings. And then I also wanted to launch the thing I'm most proud of from those from those days is a series called Player Character, where I basically took the concept of uh, or of inspiration from um, I almost said Gangs of New York, which is not what I meant. Uh, the guy who takes photos of people in New York City and posts them on Instagram with like notes and this is i feel so dumb right now no i have no idea what you're talking about so i'm i don't know what you're talking about (laughs) it it, is i swear to god it'll come to me like hours after we've done after we're done talking i'll be like mike mike (laughs) it's this 
But in any case, the, the concept is you do like a, kind of what you're doing here. Talk to people about why gaming is important to them. Like why do they invest in the hobby? And each of these videos, uh, player, player character videos was an interview with a different, you know, kind of gaming luminary, um, some from board games, but a lot primarily from the tabletop space. Did you get a lot of traction on your content? I felt like we got a lot of traction on player character compared to other things that was organic traction because it seemed genuine. It seemed authentic. And when you're trying to push games that you've been told that you need to push because you have to market them, uh, there's a difference between that and what people want to see. And what people are really hyped about oftentimes are Kickstarters. But if you're a distributor, you don't want to hype a Kickstarter. You have to wait till you have that game. So there's a lot of like playing push and pull between publishers that want you to hype their Kickstarter, but you can't do that because you won't see any benefit to that on the back end. So it's really difficult, um, but that is that is a job that exists, right? And I was so I was busy doing videos that got traction from players, but not as much from businesses, even though they were built to help businesses build pre-orders for various games that they could have ordered from us. So it was something that they tried for a while, and then they saw uh, the writing on the wall with a bunch of issues with production in China when COVID started ramping up at the end of 2019. So they, they ended up shuttering Active Player Network and everyone on our marketing team. Like our marketing team got halved. It was really tough, but I don't blame them at all. Um, it was a very amicable, like definitely it's never fun to like lose your job for reasons that you can't control, but it was definitely something that like every, everybody is still very friendly. And so I was able to take those things and say, well, what do I want to do? I think I want to make what if I could make all my gaming content feel like player character? What if it could all be what I want to do and what I want to engender? And how how would that go? So I started out with my Twitch channel and sort of felt my way through the last year with that, doing primarily video game things there. And then about halfway through the year, I was like, okay, I'm ready to launch my YouTube channel um, and do weekly videos there. And all of the videos didn't really have, like, I didn't really find my voice until I would say, right, maybe November or something like that, where I realized people are having way more of, like, a stickier relationship with all the content I'm doing about tabletop games. I think that is my space. And, you know, earlier you were saying there's a, there's a benefit. I think if it, for, for content creators to hear this kind of stuff, like, Nobody likes to be pigeonholed, but if you don't focus your voice to say a particular thing, no one will hear you because it's just noise. And people won't know whether they should subscribe because if they subscribed one week because you were playing Alien Isolation and they liked watching you get jump scared, but then you come back and you're like, these are my very deep thoughts about action economy and D&D. Like those are two different people. Those are two different needs. Um, and so you have to think about who the personas of your listeners are and then figure out how you're going to talk. Did, did I miss a video? Did you do an in-depth talk about action economy in 5th edition D&D? No, because I, I, I want to, and I want to watch this video because I need Dungeon Masters to understand action economy and why 5th edition really does it right compared to every other edition of the game. Mm. Well, that, I mean, maybe that's an idea. Maybe forthcoming. <laughs> but yeah, I mean it's on my list, but it, but yeah, it was just something I thought of at the moment. Well, no, it's it's brilliant. <laughs> it's a video that I want to watch because I want to nerd out on that sort of on that sort yeah. of stuff. When you got laid off from GTS, mm -hmm. that's when you pivoted into doing Hearthsinger games full time. Yeah, exactly. So I pivoted into it full time, um, and I have invested, you know, more than full time uh, into into that as a as a business. Uh, developed my um, professional dungeon mastering uh, business and started doing, you know, birthday parties and stuff like that um, over over Zoom and with maps and music and like the whole the whole nine yards of it. But primarily, most of the professional dungeon mastering I do is through my Patreon, where I have what is basically an MMO D and D experience, where everyone on my Discord can role play in character in various uh, Discord channels. And they're all a part of this giant adventuring company that's trying to hunt down magical artifacts that will help them be the people who will be ready to save the world when that time comes. 
And so it's very general stuff, but for people who are paying attention between each of the one shots, which can stand on their own when they sign up for a one shot uh, for a particular month, if they're paying attention, like there are connections between all of them. It's in essence very similar to what they did with uh, the Candlekeep anthology book, right? Where there's connections between all the stories. It's not going to create a campaign necessarily, but there are like, if people are talking to each other, there's benefits to be had. And now they have like, I have developed a keep system where they're uh, bringing in like potion masters and artificers. And if certain people succeed at their quest, they can add more, uh, just more options for future parties. So at the end of your quest for that particular month, you can requisition potions and supplies for the next party. So there's like this really fun feeling of paying it forward. Like we had a great time in our game today. So we want to use what we got in order to make that game cool for the next people who come through. How many games for Patreon do you find yourself running monthly? I run one or two right now because that's realistically what I can do. Um, and the things that I, I have like one, I would say two to three Patreon events every month. So there is either one uh we like watch a movie together and it's like mystery science theater 3000 on discord. That's like exclusive for Patreons, right? Or for patrons. Um, and right now we're working our way through all of the, all three Indiana Jones movies because there is no fourth film. Um, and we just don't I'll, recognize I'll, that in this house. We're going to, we're going to hit the brakes on that. So what, where, where are we taking umbrage with Shia LaBeouf's finest hour as a professional actor? What are in the, in the, in the delightful villain? The KGB uh, psychonaut or whatever she was with the the alien crystal skull. I mean, that was straight from Lucas and uh, you know Spielberg's childhoods. That was right out of pulp magazines. That's fine. I just oh no, it's a I, ransom piece of shit. Alien. No, I got gotcha. you. No, it's terrible. It's, it's a <laughs> terrible, terrible movie. I just wanted to hear your opinion. Yeah, my opinion is is just that it didn't feel um, it didn't feel authentic. Like it felt like. How can we make another Indiana Jones movie? It didn't feel like this is a story that needs to be told. If you're going to if you're going to end with Last Crusade, which is so much about like legacy and relationships with our parents and their expectations and like there's so much I'm like getting teary I just think about it. There's so much in that film that is about more than, you know, an adventure. And you can't go from that to alien without that like genuine feeling again you just lose it i mean it's the same reason why and i don't get me wrong i love the prequels in their own way for star wars but uh is that that disingenuous feeling in phantom menace is kind of the same thing where people are like what we just blew up the death star and you're giving me this shit like <laughs> <laughs> like <laughs> I suffered through Ewoks, and you're giving me this, and I love Ewoks, so don't come for me. But The Ewok people can come for me. In fact, the greatest picture I've seen on Facebook recently was, it was, it was you know, warning kids, it was graphic, but it, it's Vader, and he's holding half of an Ewok in his left hand, and his lightsaber in his right, and he's flanked by stormtroopers of the 501st, and I was just like, yeah, that's, that's, what, that's what I needed to happen. Thanks. I hate that. Uh, I love you, <laughs> but yeah. Uh, but yeah, so I guess that's, that's kind of like my thing. Like stories, stories can be fantastical and wonderful, but at the end of the day, they have to have something that I gravitate towards and, and can cling to that is human. And by that, I mean, it doesn't need to be specifically humans that are having those feelings in these films, but uh, it is something that is a recognizable uh, human quality. Like I'm, I'm running Rise of Tiamat right now, and it's not just like dragons bad. People need to save world from apocalypse. Like the way that I think about that, uh, that's very related to our world. And I checked with my my party to make sure that they were okay with investigating this. Is like the the sensibility that for me, like the religious right has, that is really difficult for me to handle as a person who's trying to like live with bodily autonomy respectfully in a world where people don't want me to have that. You know, I really wanted to deal with what is a cult? How easy is it to be in a cult? Who is susceptible to that kind of thing? And so a lot of my NPCs aren't just like, I'm an evil cult man. Like they meet people they've known in their lives who are now in this cult. And the further they get, the further they realize, like, these are just people who needed something. And this cult was here at the right time to take advantage of that. So those are things I think about all the time when I'm creating 
especially longer term campaigns. But I try to keep it in front of mind all the time. And again, I swear to Christ, I'm sober. But talking to you, it I, I have this this theory about gamers and the generations of gamers mm-hmm. and and how the hobby has evolved, right? So. I would call you a Gen 3 gamer, so you're kind of growing up in that golden age of openness and really acceptingness of the Mm -hmm. hobby. It's as if the hobby was started by these gnarled old wizards who spoke in a secret (laughs) language, who didn't want people to be a part of it. They just are tired of getting bullied by fighters, and they just want to be left alone and and and, and have their mechanics. And then people are like, you know, maybe I don't need a book to cast spells. Maybe I can just be a sorcerer. And I can just go out and I can just kind of feel it. And mechanics are important, but I don't need that book to really cast these spells. And now people like you are your bards. I mean, as you as you call yourself, you are actively proselytizing and saying, here's the hobby and the mechanics are important when you need them to be important. But the thing that you should prioritize is exploration and storytelling and narrative. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when, when I was younger, I would have never ever conceived of having gaming like you're talking about. I would have had very monolithic one dimensional good versus bad sort of thing. Even as an adult, an adult, I, I do that sometimes because I think that narratively there's a place for that, but yeah, it's, it's wonderful to think that, I've I've known this woman my entire life, and she's always mm-hmm. been good to me. How could she believe these just horrendous, horrendous things? How do I do it, and how do I help her? And am I wrong? Are, are they right? Yeah. Did I? I mean, obviously they're not. They're terrible. But but I love her. Why would she fall victim to this? Yeah, and I think the the big key here is like for me, I'm investigating like when is it okay to like protect yourself and say you've gone too far. Like, why are we expected always to be Luke Skywalker and Padme and always believe that, like, the person is going to change for us? Like, that's gaslighting. That's actually really toxic to always believe that. So it's it's a wonderful idea that people can always turn back. But at some point, it has to be their responsibility. It's not Luke who turns Vader. Vader decides, you know. Um, so now we're back on Star Wars. It takes zero time for me to get there. Uh, as you can see, uh, obviously we're on video and this won't be, but I'm surrounded by Star Wars shit because it is, it is my, my everything when I'm not playing D&D. Um, but yeah, so that, I think that's an important, an important investigation, especially in our world right now where everything is so different that, you know, empathy is important and understanding how people get to be how they are is important and where they're coming from is so important, but also deciding where your line is and when the need for self-preservation comes and what it's about, I think, is also really important. And that's not to say that I think every D&D game should be played this way. Like, if you are someone who loves to play a fighter and go into a dungeon and knock some heads in, like, be my guest. It's just not the game I'm interested in running or really playing in. And I think that that's important to know. I think people should have more conversations at the beginning of their play where they say, like, what kind of game do we want to play? And that's why I brought all of this up to my uh, Rise of Tiamat game when we started playing about a year and a half ago because I wanted to make sure they were okay because some of that is, like, way too real for people right now. They don't want to investigate that. Uh, and that would have been totally fine. We would have picked something else for me to base the, the campaign around. Right. Not that um, I want to get into a political thing, but it, it, it sounds like, yeah. and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but there are there's some modern-day allegory that can be drawn to this campaign. Is that what I'm feeling? Totally. Okay. Totally, yeah. And for, for me, that was what I wanted to do. And, you know, I don't think that that's for everybody, but that's what I wanted to do as a storyteller at the time, so that's how I presented it, and I found a group that was excited about that. But, I, you know, there are tons of ways to be happy playing D&D, and there's one for everybody. Sure, and I am I am often guilty of of, uh, of persecuting people for wrong fun. Again, tongue for lean cheek. <laughs> My show is called Why We Game, and it's very, very on the mm. nose. What is it about it that just you, you – not only do you, you keep coming back, but you've made it such an important part of your life and identity? Uh, I think it's – I think I game to feel creative on a very basic level. Like I, I, I game to feel creative. I play Dungeons and Dragons. This sounds so over the top, but like really as, as, as an expression of, of art. 
that's not over the top at all. Um, mm-hmm. There was a guy who used to do a podcast named Jim McClure, did a show called mm-hmm. Talking Tabletop, one of my inspirations. And he always referred to role-playing games as the highest form of art. And mm-hmm. I, I agree with him. Again, it sounds very pretentious and douchey, yeah. but... I, I I completely agree with you. I don't I don't think that that's an off base uh, off base analysis at all. Yeah, I mean when I for and again this is this is just where I'm coming from. Like I I went to theater school and you know left theater school during you know a depression, uh, not like my personal depression, although that's like a whole other topic. Uh, but uh, during during the time when you know the the economy totally crashed. There were no day jobs. There were no art jobs. Like nobody was leaving their contracts and shows. Like it was awful. It was an awful time to be out there. And also like, just to be clear, like I'm a woman of size. I am not going, you know, I was always cast and stuff as the mom or the lesbian on the verge of a nervous breakdown. And I always had a role in something in college. Like I was not somebody who I was very lucky in that way, and I worked very hard and did a lot of auditions and always had a show I was working on. So going from that and feeling like I was always, you know, a desirable pick uh, to entering the real world and discovering, like, standing in a line full of people where you literally have a casting director stand and look at you and go, face too pretty for ugly best friend but can't be the lead because of body. Okay, thank you so much. Brutal. So that's what happened. Like, and I'm not, I, weirdly, I'm not really offended by that because that, that's the casting process. But I felt so bereft when it came to the ability to tell stories that rediscovering Dungeons and Dragons and, you know, as someone who was very interested in, in web series, like I saw the guilds and was like, you know what? If Felicia Day can tell stories about World of Warcraft, maybe I can do that. So, like, I developed with uh, my good friend, uh, Brian Deckhart, uh, who I went to school with. We did a show when we first graduated called Ocast, which was a mockumentary series about the Greek gods living in New York City. <laughs> so, like, first I looked to web series. And then I was like, no, I'm still being pigeonholed. Like, how can I have the breadth of experience and expression that I had in college again? And it really came down to telling stories through Dungeons and Dragons and through other systems as well. I know you mentioned Lost Mountain Saga earlier, but I play in a, a Nordic horror game based on Free League Publishing's Vassin system, which is all about turn, a, a different version of turn of the century Sweden, where uh, the industrial age is rushing up against the old world religion, and you are kind of caught in that mix. And so I, I love other systems as well, as long as I can find a reason to tell a good story. A good story in there, um, but yeah, that's really it. It that's why it became an art for me. That's that's how I found it was because I was trying to fill that hole of self expression that I think has driven me always in everything I do. You was said as much earlier that fifth edition. Mm-hmm. Dungeons and Dragons is really going to be a solid place to focus content just based mm-hmm. on the the statistics and the number of people who are yeah. likely to consume that. You obviously like to play 5th edition D&D. It's obviously your preferred edition. Mm-hmm. Is D&D your preferred game and your preferred tool for storytelling? Or is there something that, all things being equal, you would far more likely gravitate toward? I will say that when I am dungeon mastering, I feel happiest in 5th edition. Other than that, I feel happiest with stuff that has very little rules. Like, uh, gosh, what is the game I'm thinking of? Um, Ten Candles, which is a game where, uh, basically the group works together to create relationships. There are ten, there are ten candles and over time, failing checks burns the candles and you have less and less, uh, economy to make these checks and everyone eventually, the conceit of it is you have to play it like you don't think you're going to die but you have to understand as players that like everybody is going to die by the end of the game. So it's, it's like your ultimate horror game. And I love running horror. Like I love it Uh, because, because everyone is brave when you're playing a game like that, everyone makes the bravest choices. No one is sitting there going, 
oh, God, what am I going to do? Well, I guess I could throw fireball, but maybe I'll hit somebody. But if we don't do something, we're not going to get out of the room. Well, what about those glowing rooms, though? Maybe I could roll an arcana check. Make a decision. You don't have this much time in a six-second round. Uh, so... <laughs> Sorry, that just came out of me. No, no, uh, you are you. You're a game master of uh, your. I mean, I am. I am of your ilk. I. Yeah. In, in, <laughs> in fact, among among my friends, I I have kind of a reputation not as a tyrant, but as a taskmaster because I I can't lose the table momentum. That's the key, yeah. and it's something that I feel like I learn every day how to keep it rolling. Yeah, no, I noticed that because I actually, coincidentally, I I watched a large portion of your Ten Candles AP, and oh. <laughs> uh, and and we have similar game mastering styles. I think that yours mm-hmm. is a bit of a more deliberate and gentle hand than mine, but uh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, we're definitely I'm with you, man. If I could take your turn, it's pissing me off. Yeah. I don't know. I used to I used to game with this guy. God bless him. He's he's in his fifties now. I don't think he's ever played anything but Shadowrun and D and D. He's always an elf mm. wizard. He always takes the same action. So I got a thirty second t- a sand timer, and when we game, yep. I just burps down. I don't care. He can waffle. He can oscillate. He can look on his phone for all I care. When that thirty seconds is up, the next person's going. Yep. No, it's it's really helpful, and you know, it's certainly something I am always looking for the balance of being a kind, nurturing DM while also saying there are stakes. Uh, And that is why I, too, also have a a timer in place. And I also, I think the way I handled it, again, with my Tiamat group is they really hem and haw, and I have somebody who uh, their their disability, like, really hinders their ability for decision-making. And so I have worked with them to figure out, like, do you need quiet? Like, what do you need? How can I, how can I help this go forward for you? How can we help you? Um, and I think, you know, you can't be so much of a tyrant that you're not paying attention to what the players need, but you can't totally serve what the players need or nothing will ever happen. And there's no risk involved a lot of the time. So I think it's always thinking that you're not a good enough listener and always trying to be better at that. Um, while also, you know, for them, I, I eventually was like, here's the thing that I think is happening at our table. I think you guys are having too much time to make decisions. And so I'm letting you know, moving forward, that from here on out, I'm going to say time is ticking. And at that point, within the next 30 seconds, you need to make a decision based on the things you've discussed. And I think that's worked really well for them because I didn't spring it on them. It didn't seem like I was mad at them. I was just like, tonight was fine, but here's something I'm struggling with. I think it will make our story more exciting and keep us moving when you guys realize there's a deadline, you know? Um, and so we've, we've been working on that as a table together and I think it's gone pretty well, but yeah, I mean, sometimes you got to workshop things and every group is going to kind of have different needs, which is something you learn even more when people start paying you to play with them and you're dealing with all sorts of different personalities at the table. Did you ever manage personnel professionally? Yes. <laughs> okay. No, yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I figured, I mean, again, I, I don't want to, I, I mean, I, I didn't, I, that I did not learn on the internet. That was just a, that was just a guess. A guess. But <laughs> But uh, when I mean, I don't, again, it's not about me. I have done personnel management for most of my life, and I have found the overlap between good game mastering technique and good personnel management because it's the same exercise. I have a variety of different personalities that I'm trying to get to have a similar experience, whether that is a pleasant and efficient working experience mm-hmm. or that is a pleasurable and entertaining narrative experience. I have mm-hmm. to manage their expectations and their individual personalities. So it was clear to me that that, that was something, that a skill set that you had developed for sure. Yeah. And I think D&D helped me get there, honestly. I think I'm a very different dungeon master now than I was, you know, the first time I ran a one shot. It takes practice and it takes understanding. Um, and you know, I've, I've harped on it in a million different places, but session zero, it never seems like it's important until suddenly you don't talk to anyone, talk to someone anymore. Like it is the most important thing you can do. And the thing is, you'll never think that it's that important until something terrible happens. So make sure you do it because you'll understand the game that everybody wants to play, the tone everybody wants to play in, 
what the expectations are from you as a dungeon master. You know, you need to respond to me when I give you a deadline within, you know, 24 hours by the end of the week or, you know, setting the tone for when, even when you're available, like I have to tell them I am really busy during the day. So sometimes I have to respond to you when I'll respond to you, but I promise it will be within 48, 48 hours. And please don't think I'm not interested in your idea if I don't immediately respond. You know, I think setting those expectations really helps with some of the chemistry and table behavior that isn't played out in the narrative. Um, and that's just as important as what you do in your storytelling and, and with your, uh, you know, mechanical decisions. <laughs> I know this is a meandering, but that's how my brain works. Mm-hmm. Are you Fine. are you pro GM screen or anti screen? I like the screen. Um, I want people to trust me, but I also deserve a place to be like, well, that's terrible. Like yesterday, I was running a one shot for some people that is in the Rime of the Frost Maiden book, so it was pre written and not by me. And I was just like looking at the way roles were going and the way it was written, and I was like, I don't like this. I'm not having this dragon kill everybody with a single breath just because this adventure is written this way. Like, they deserve to be able to make at least one choice each to help mitigate this. Uh, But the way it's written, it's like, dragon comes, you die. And yet it expects you to escape from the dragon. You know, it's kind of how it's written. And, you know, I was glad for the screen. I mean, obviously in this case, we were playing remotely, but I was glad to be able to make those decisions because Having a good time is not depending on dependent on whether or not a player character dies, but it is dependent on whether or not they felt they had the agency in the particular situation. And so if I felt that the thing was written, that the module was written in a way that it sort of removed their agency in a way that I felt wasn't fair, then I felt I needed to change dice roll. I'm trying to figure out your dump stat. Mine is wisdom. I mean, wisdom is for right. sure. My, well, but your right. chari- but your charisma is like a twenty-four. Like, how does that's I know that's beyond human. That's beyond human maximum. I don't understand how you did it. And you're so smart. I'm so oh. envious because. Okay, I do. And it's gonna, in my glow, Mike. That's I, all I can offer. I'm gonna. You. I'm gonna sound. I'm gonna sound braggy. Um, I do. Yeah. A, I do a podcast called Fear the Boot. And Fear the Boot mm-hmm. is one of the oldest running advice role playing game podcasts in the industry. Mm-hmm. It's been since 2006. And I didn't join until years, years later. But no shit, the session zero is credited to that podcast. That's awesome. Yeah, it's pretty, it's, it's, it's neat how really the world, cool. neat how the world kind of goes full circle like that. But I, I didn't start doing that stuff until I was an adult. Mm-hmm. Have you always had such a solid hold and vision for what it was that you wanted to convey in gaming? And were you always this open and receptive to other people's needs and desires in the game? Because I sure as shit was not. I think when I became a dungeon master, it was in essence to provide that kind of nurturing firm guidance uh, and adjudication that I didn't feel I got in games all the time. And I say that with love because I have a very dear friend who was my dungeon master when we all decided we wanted to play and still is my dungeon master to this day. But there was, there was a lot of frustration. I mean, I had, you know, every, every stereotypical thing, I felt like he always favored, uh, the woman who is now his wife, right? Like I felt like anything I wanted to do, if he didn't think it was good or I wasn't making people laugh, then it wasn't good enough. So I always played like a gnome bard or something small that could be silly, you know? And I never allowed myself to come the depths of my soul, uh, in the way that I do these days. But, a lot of it was like, it wasn't a like, well, fuck you response. It was just like, well, is, am I crazy? Like, is it possible to provide this other path? Um, and through seeing, you know, people like, uh, Matthew Mercer and, um, Jerry Holkins, um, from over at Penny Arcade, I feel like is a very gent, has a very gentle, but firm and high concept hand. And also to, to an extent, uh, Chris Perkins who, you know, sort of definitely delivers his pronouncements from on high about whether something is or isn't going to work, but is is very 
kind person. Like you can tell that he's a kind person, even though he's like always looking for a way to surprise and, and, you know, hurt consensually hurt uh, his players. Um, and those, those people for me really told me once I started watching these actual plays more often, like, yes, it is, it is possible. And so that's when I started my dungeon mastering experience based on all of those experiences. And I am not perfect at it. And I've, I've tried to become better and better, but I think if you think you're perfect at it, then you're never going to be. So I think it's, it's always been a drive ever since I wanted to start DMing, which was more when I was, you know, in my mid twenties, probably. Um, so for about the last decade, it's been a drive of mine. Um, but yeah, I've always, I've certainly always wanted to be as welcoming, uh, as possible in geek spaces because I felt very much not welcomed in geek spaces. I was tremendously bullied when I was at boarding school because I had just walls full of Star Wars stuff. And that was not cool to young girls in the Boston area. <laughs> that was really not cool for them. Uh, and I got, I got made fun of for that and for being in chorus. And it wasn't until, you know, I was excelling at being in musical, like in, in, into musical theaters and like into musical theater and, and winning, you know, various Shakespeare festival awards and stuff like that, that they were like, Oh, this is like a real thing. And I think Tabor was a great school for that reason, because as long as you were passionate and excelling in what you liked, people started liking you for that, even if you were a nerd or a jock or wherever you kind of fell in the social cast. But my freshman, sophomore, and even a lot of my junior year were real rough because of the, of the bullying and um, just feeling like it wasn't okay to like be a girl because that was boy stuff. And, you know, in middle school, I was always told like, oh, you can't play Star Wars with us. That's, that's for boys. You're a girl. And I think that's a classic story, right? I think a lot of people feel that way. I already mentioned the stuff with like older brothers not allowing us to play with their, you know, video game stuff and, you know, making us feel like girls weren't good at games or whatever the case may be. Uh, that stuff still exists today. It, it's shockingly changed so much. And I, I celebrate that. But there are elements that exist today. And if it's not one thing that you're being excluded from, it's another or there's another group of people that's being excluded and needs to be heard. And so that is from the very beginning, something I've always felt very passionate about. That's an area in gaming that has certainly changed over time in an area that I'm so intrigued about having conversation, but I mm. don't have a perspective on the hobby other than being a middle-aged, doughy, Caucasian child of the 80s, right? Like, so <laughs> yeah. m- my gaming experience was that refuge of I'm going to go to this place and mm-hmm. escape because my, my, my father has all but abandoned us and our mother yeah. is a monstrous abusive person and I'm bullied at school for being poor or for coming to school with, you know, the obvious signs of a beating from my parents. And that place is where I wanted to go and and hide and it breaks my heart and I know it's true right because I know that yeah. most of the people even to this day that do gaming look like me but it's sad to think and I think that Mike Webb from uh, Alliance Games put it best it's baked in the cake we should accept mm-hmm. everybody because we spent so much time being persecuted I mean the number of people that my in my generation that were raped by priests I mean it's crazy right mm-hmm. just we we we, hi, we just want to hide from this thing and I just sad to think that we would exclude other people for being other when we were shit on so much for being other. It's hard, yeah. right? And I don't, and I don't it, get that. It's weird. I mean, I think it comes up in lots of different fandoms. Um, it's especially evident in the Star Wars fandom. And I always try empathy first, right? Like you, always, I, I understand why this has been the thing. That whatever these fandoms are, whatever you're involved in, like this is what has gotten you through the worst times in your whole fucking life so of course you want to feel like it's mine you can't have this this is my touchstone this is what i need to get through it all um but i always just want to like it's like weird resource guarding with an animal you know it's like you want to approach the rabid squirrel and be like i'm not looking to take this from you i'm just looking to share it like 
I'm looking to also be here with my own nut in this tree. Why am I using a squirrel analogy? I don't know. I, this is I, getting away from me. I adore it. No, <laughs> but but you're you're so right. People wanting to be part of a thing or a culture that you are passionate about isn't them trying to take it from you, right? And mm-hmm. I don't I don't think that it is unreasonable to have those sorts of conversations, but they're difficult, right? A lot of people don't they don't want to yeah. have them. Yeah, they don't want to have them. And, you know, I certainly don't tolerate, like, Nazis and racists uh, at all. Those things don't deserve to be tolerated. But uh, I am willing to have a conversation about, like, why do you not like The Last Jedi? I'm not going to tell you that you're wrong for not thinking that it's cinematically perfect. But as long as you can express what you didn't like and I can express what I did like and you can be like, it's awesome that you got to feel that way. And I can be like, I'm sorry, this wasn't the Empire Strikes Back. Then it's okay. That's an okay conversation to have. Uh, what's not okay is hearing, you know, if you like The Last Jedi, somebody else didn't. And you're like, well, you're a racist because of your feelings. They might, like, there may be times where that might be true. But just, like, unloading that and not listening to why they don't like it, if you're open to listening to a, to a conversation, right? Uh, there's a difference between a conversation and, like, a speech on the mountain. That is like, this is the opinion. This is, you, this is your opinion, you know? Um, anyways, this is getting away from me. But, yeah, I think I think those conversations are hard to have, but important. And as long as everybody is respectful and celebrates, the fact that everybody gets to be there, then it's fine to disagree as long as you're not telling somebody else that they are extremely wrong just for having the audacity to say that they don't like something that you liked or vice versa. The idea that we are so exclusionary and elitist about playing pretend. I mean, the it's just idiocy. Yeah, I got, I got that a lot because I ran a, I ran a fifth edition um, one shot for the guys over at the, uh, at the glass cannon and you know a lot of people who were like even though it's fifth edition i guess i'll listen to it but you know there were other people who were like i just can't handle it when it's not one of the guys dming i'm out completely dismissing another voice that they had invited into their community just because like i'm not one of the guys and things things like that are they're hurtful but i like not in a you know, they're hurtful and I'm hurt forever type of way. It's just like they're damaging to that community to not be open. And this is an area, and I don't know why I'm getting so sappy. And this is an area that... I, that my, I have that effect on my, people. <laughs> that my wife, and I, my wife and I discuss, you know, my, my wife so, is a, a, a very attractive, extremely intelligent, shitty taste in men, but mm-hmm. very smart, middle-aged Caucasian woman. And, you know, she will point out to me obvious... Just bias isn't even around the right word. It's just ignorance. It's just not looking mm-hmm. at because I don't know what it's like to walk through the world as a woman, right? And to be yeah. to be heckled and catcalled and and what have you. And I just it's it's helpful to have somebody who not only is willing to understand my ignorance but help me work through it, right? I just yeah. you know if I'm doing something wrong, man, I'll fucking apologize. I just need to know where I'm screwing up. Yeah. And I think that's that's one of the things we can learn as a you know as a in the greater gaming community is just because somebody says like we have a problem you know with <clears throat> sensibilities of imperialism and racism in you know classical fantasy instead of being like but I love Lord of the Rings maybe just take a minute to be like well why are orcs offensive I honestly hadn't thought about it and I'll do my research too. Like if you if you tell me that there's an article about it, I'll go and find it and I'll read it. Don't expect the person who is, you know, in the marginalized community to do the work for us when we have the privilege, right? Uh, we have to go and do that. And you know, things as well when you're inviting people to your table, if you're running an actual play or something like that, and you're trying to find new players, don't be like, well, I just don't know anyone who's not white. Go out there and listen to the countless stories being told by people who are not like you and right. fucking reach out. They'll probably be jazzed if somebody cared enough to invite them to the table, even if they can't go. And then you've created a new relationship with somebody who has a different experience than you. 
Yeah. Um, but it's not on them to enter the hobby. It's on us to be like, hey, door's open for you. Yeah, I want... Please come sit at my table. Yeah. Do you do you like dragons? Okay, we should hang out. You you know... And dungeons. Yeah, Are you, you kidding well, me? <laughs> wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. You like giant orbs that float in space that are almost the size of a moon that blow up entire planets? That's amazing. I love that, That's too. So cool. We should hang out. Yeah. I don't care what your skin looks like. I don't care what makes you come. What I care about is that we both agree that Sauron's the bad guy. That's what yeah, I, you know, that's totally. what, yeah, that's what totally. I want out of it, right? That's what I, that's the experience that I want to have with people. And I think art, going to art school also taught me the valuable skill of, you know, you can be critical of something you love. Just because I'm critical of something or just because I love something doesn't mean I can't find fault with it in some way. Uh, and some people hate that because they're like, if I love it, I just want to like it and be over with. That's fine. It's kind of that same thing where you hear in couples therapy, like sometimes you should ask your uh, significant other, do you want advice or do you just want me to say that sucks and give you a hug? Some people find that to, to be offensive, but it's so helpful to ask that question because I am the kind of person who's like, let me help you. Let me come up with ways to solve this. And not everybody wants that. And it's the same uh, with, you know, if you're posting about some of these issues on Twitter and you see conversation and you see people get upset because they're like, I was telling you about a thing. I wasn't asking you to solve the problem that I had. I'm trying to expose you to the fact that this happens. So maybe ask or just like it and retweet it and move on. If you're not adding anything to a conversation, don't attempt to regurgitate what the person has said about their experience. I have been in marriage counseling and I have had exactly that conversation. My wife and I have been together. I'm 46. We've been together since 1992. So almost 29 years that we have been together. And dude, that's us, right? Because my, my wife is very sharp, very analytical. And she's like, okay, this is how we attack the problem. And I am very chaotic and disorganized as I'm like, baby, I just need to vent. I need to, I need to feel my feelings yeah, right now. I need to I need to explode and maybe throw something and then I'll feel <laughs> you know. Yeah, totally, totally. And I think that's it's it's really important. I mean we always come I do a podcast on that shameless plug. Uh a that, podcast on uh Friday on my Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash singer games. And we always come back to the fact that playing D&D with people is like being in a polyamorous relationship. Like you just have to keep total communication open. Like the conversation is never concluded. Like you always have to care a lot about how other people are doing and what their needs are. And it's just, it's just very true. It's just very true. And that's what we come back to every week. And we're like, so basically what we're saying is we're D&D dating. Like, <laughs> I think that the end of the day. that analogy is fantastic, and it explains so much about my hangups because I could not be polyamorous for two reasons. One, I'm far too jealous. I just I'm I'm a mm -hmm. very jealous person, and I know that that would just that would be a border for me. That I'm like yeah. I can't I can't cross that line. But I I, I just sounds like so much fucking work. It's so it's much work, work and scheduling. It's a lot of work. And I just, I love my wife, but I think one of the reasons that our relationship is successful is because neither of us want to put this much work into anything else. Yeah, yeah. Well, and the thing is, like, I'm I'm friends with a lot of people uh, who play D and D and are and are poly, and that's why like it comes up as you know a conversation. Um, for me, like, I've I've done it, and I was kind of like, that's a lot of work. And for me, it wasn't jealousy; it was more just the feeling of like. I am so interested in how everybody else is feeling that I don't tend to champion my own feelings. And then I get upset, even though I never asked for what I needed. That's my, my pattern. And so I don't really think that those, those types of relationships that like lead to me being my best self. But other than that, go with God, but it is, it does make sense. And the thing is, I think these D and D tables, like the way that you relate to people at the table, not just when you're in character, but how you relate to your friends, you should champion them and you should care about them that much and you should be willing to have difficult conversations if something isn't working for you but we're so conditioned to be like let things roll off your back like don't feel feelings especially men I think are uh, conditioned to be like whatever just let it go like you're not you're not allowed to express your real feelings and I just think that that's that's so unfortunate 
uh, that like we are gendered in that way in society, but it definitely comes up in D and D where without, one of the things I ask during session zero is, are you willing to have conversations where somebody doesn't like something that you've done? Are you willing to have a real conversation with your friends about someone being unhappy? And are you willing to work on things as a group? And if they say no, I'm like, Hashtag triggers, like you can't be at this table because if I always have to be the one to initiate a difficult conversation about like a social dynamic, then like that's just not fair to me to always have to be the one. But as the DM, it is my job to uh, moderate those conversations, but I shouldn't have to be the only one who's always brave enough to have it unless I'm being paid for the game, which is a totally different scenario. But most of the time, I really look for people who are willing to have those things. doesn't mean it'll come up, but at some point, very likely, someone's going to have an issue. You've exposed two scars of the veteran game master, right? The, the first one being is that the burden of having these difficult conversations mm-hmm. falls on you, even though that it, it, it shouldn't. But the other issue is, is that it is often the responsibility of the game master to facilitate everything above their own happiness. And that's why you're yeah. a good, that's why you're a good game master is mm-hmm. that you have the ability to take the other people at the table and put their needs above yours to the detriment of your own happiness. And I think that yeah. there are many, many of us that game master that are yeah. passionate about storytelling that do precisely that. Yeah, I think it's true. And I think, uh, I think I sometimes get gloom and doom about this when people ask me about it or when we're talking about it on around the hearth on Fridays or, you know, in conversations like this. And I think it's because I'm really passionate about making sure that people understand why there are so many people out there who complain that, well, I just can't keep a table together for more than six months because they're not willing to have a hard conversation. There's somebody or somebody's at that table who's making it difficult, whether it's, well, they can't commit to the schedule. Well, did you have a conversation about how you really passionately wanted this to be a weekly event and they just weren't as serious, but you didn't cut it off at the past because you never had the conversation or somebody did something at the table that made somebody else uncomfortable or took agency away from them and everybody just went, well, whatever, it's fine. I'll get over it instead of being like, I didn't really like that you made me do that or said that I had to do that in that scenario. And I'm kind of fine with moving forward with it for story's sake now, but in the future, maybe we could handle that differently. All of these games, for one reason or another, they break apart because you're not as good at communication as you could be. So if that's not, that's not a skill you want to work with, uh, aside from learning all the cool facts about NPCs and dragons and things like that, like, then this is not the game for you. (laughs) Walter. Right. Well, and I think another another challenge, too, and this is going to be, I don't know, not controversial, but certainly an ugly mm-hmm. thing to say. I'm not good at running. I can't jump hurdles and I'm never going to pole vault. Right. Some people mm-hmm. just aren't good storytellers. They're not good. They're not good at running the game. They're not good at managing the table and their friends don't want to hurt their feelings. Yeah, there's going to I think there's going to be uh some solution for everyone who wants to play. See, right? you're so optimistic, and I, I'm so, I feel like I can't. I have such a dark heart that I'm. <laughs> How do I mean? I'll be honest with you. Sometimes the reason I get asked to do paid games is because they're like, no one, I can't get a game to stick together, and then they are paying me to keep that game together. That and that's just the truth, right? Um, and that's fine. They they're paying for a service that they know they can't do. I get a task rabbit if I need to mount something on my ceiling. Like, I can't do that. I pay somebody. And that's, you know, a lot of, there are a lot of, uh, you know, conversations about, I don't understand what a professional dungeon master does. I don't understand why anybody would pay for that when I do it for free every week and I'm glad to. That's great. I'm glad to do it for free for certain people that are in my, you know, hobby circle. But I've become really skilled at keeping tables together and at having these conversations and making people feel safe. And that, as you've said, is not something everybody can do. So, yes, it is a monetizable currency. 
And that's how I feel about it. I could not agree with that sentiment more either. Uh, I am, I'm frankly, I mean, I've gone from not, from just being like, ah, whatever, because I, I did paid game mastering before, Mm -hmm. before the, not before the internet existed, but before the internet was a big deal. Back when the Sacagawea gold dollar was a thing and we would sit down at the table and I would open up my game master screen and my PCs would just splash the center of the table with gold coins and and we would and we would play and i charged five dollars a head per game session and had five players and we did we played every we played every week so i was making 25 bucks basically you know making you know beer money to play D &D for a group of guys who i probably abused as a you know was probably terrible and mean and (laughs) bullying to them at the game table but kept paying yeah for sure (laughs) There are few forms of art that provide an opportunity for feedback like gaming does, but combine immediate feedback with participation. And I think you have a remarkably unique thing that no other art form does, that movies don't do, video games don't do to the same degree, books don't do, comic books don't do. And the idea that you would take this performance art and want to make money from it, I'm frankly, at this point in my life, I am insulted by someone that thinks that that's not worth money. Yeah, yeah, I think... And to be fair, a friend of mine, uh, my good friend Miles, who runs our uh, Starfound game, started being a professional dungeon master. And he said, I think I'm going to start doing this professionally. And I will 10 out of 10 say, I don't understand how you're going to do that, is what I said. I said, I don't get it. Like, people, that's not a value. Like, people can do it for themselves. And I wasn't flippant about it in that I didn't. You know, I wasn't unencouraging to my friend who wanted to launch a business, but I did say, like, make sure you're really offering something of value before you do that. Otherwise, it's not going to have very much staying power. You know, whether that's making sure you always have great music or you have, like, your own personalized Session Zero sheet that you can send out. Like, really make it feel like it is a branded experience. Otherwise, I don't think people are going to keep paying for it. Like, is this a thing? And I watched him go through it, and it's something he still works on, but he has a full slate, and he does that and Twitch basically full-time and makes enough money to live and to be happy. And, you know, I couldn't be happier for him. And honestly, you know, while my kind of business design is is different than his, we often talk about it a lot, but he was a big source of inspiration because he proved me wrong, that, like, there was value in it. And in talking to him and seeing the kinds of people who were hiring him and the types of things I wanted to be involved with, uh, and I really felt like I can do a super, I can make, I can give you the best one shot you've ever had. Like where you feel like emotions because of a one shot. Cause one shots can feel really slow or throwaways to, to a lot of people. Like I know I have that skill. So doing stuff like birthday parties or three weeks of, you know, a multi-part adventure with a group of people, I think, you know, is something I can do really well. And so I've kind of scheduled my, business that isn't around patreon around doing that kind of stuff and it's been great and you know i can sit down and um depending on the number of people and the the style of the game it's generally about 200 to 250 dollars depending on whether it's like five or six players and i think it's really cool and i'm gonna add on stuff for i have an artist now so if you want your characters drawn it'll be you know x number of dollars to get a piece of art with the full party at the end of it things like that. So I think there's stuff you can do that gives people access to elements that help them celebrate and honor the, their commitment to their hobby in ways that they wouldn't have immediately thought of or have access to that does make it a monetizable, like you said, a a piece of art experience that they can invest in. And, you know, I'm the kind of person who has dice made of gemstones. So don't at me if you think like, oh, I don't have to spend anything on this hobby. Like I've spent thousands of dollars on dice at this point. So I, I'm into it. I'm there for it. It'll happen. The books that I have purchased and read for game mastering advice. So I could be, I mean, mm-hmm. it's, I mean, I'm not embarrassed by it because I adore this hobby, but, uh, you know, I mean, I, I think maybe some people would be embarrassed by it. I am going to ask, do you, do you ever get peanut butter in your chocolate because you love Star Wars? But we haven't talked about Star Wars tabletop role-playing games. The very first 
game I ever ran that was a campaign was the Star Wars RPG from Fantasy Flight. So it wasn't D&D at all. Uh, I love running Star Wars games. I have considered running one on my channel. Basically, I don't, I'm in a place on my channel where I'm like, okay, I have to bring an actual play in and I just don't know who I can get and how much I could pay them or could I get people to agree for short arcs for free? Like these are the kinds of content creation questions we all, we all ask, but I would love to do another one. But yeah, I did, I did a, for about a year and a half, I ran a Star Wars RPG game set in the time period between the last Jedi and the rise of Skywalker. And I had a little secret weapon in my back pocket. Oh wait, no, it wasn't that. It was between it was between uh, the Force Awakens and the Last Jedi. That's what it was. Um, and uh, my secret weapon was that because I was a member of uh, Rebel Legion and uh, Saber Guild, which are uh, Lucasfilm affiliated costuming charity groups, kind of like the Five Hundred First Legion, but for Jedi and Sith characters or Rebel characters, I often would get to see films early. And so leading up to our final episode, uh, because we were doing this as an actual play on a Twitch channel, um, leading up to our final episode, I knew things about The Last Jedi that other people didn't know. And so I was able to preempt certain things in the way that it it turned out when I saw it, I was like, oh, man, that these uh, these kyber powered super weapons are like a big theme in this movie and I've been making them a big theme in my game. And I like cried when I saw, uh, in, in the, La- in the last Jedi, when they're, uh, pulling that giant like cannon up to the front door, when they're holed up, um, on, on crate, is, is it crate? I don't remember where they are on the salt flat planet. Um, fake nerd. Uh, but <laughs> they pull, they pull the cannon up and they're like, Oh my God, it's a, it's a death star S weapon. Right. And I was like, I can't believe that for two years nearly, I have been telling stories about these guys going around the galaxy and finding out that, uh, you know, the, the first order has been able to take technology and miniaturize like Death Star tech and take it on individual ships and things like that. And so it had been building up to something like that. And so I basically came up with a reason why they didn't come when Leia calls for all of the members of the resistance to to come to this final showdown. And so I came up with like a really cool final episode for them, which is why they couldn't answer Leia when she finally calls them. Uh, Anyways, it was great. Uh, This is so not important, but, uh, but yeah, I love, I love running it. Uh, I would love to run that system again because it's very much, have you, have you had a chance to play it? Well, so yes, but I, and that's what kind of what I wanted to ask you is personally as a gamer, I find that dice system to be really mm. uh, too much for me, right? The the older I get and the, uh, the the less cognitive ability I have, I want something that is going to adjudicate and resolve action faster. Have you tried using the app that just tells you how many successes and failures you rolled? No, and again, and here's this is again, I need a, I need gaming therapy because mm-hmm. here's here's my other hang up is that a tablet is not how you roll dice. They must okay. be in hand. So, I, yeah, I, you don't, you're making fun of me. I can see it. You're judging. I can see it. I'm not making fun of you. Uh, I'm not making fun of you at all. I totally understand that. I waffle back and forth between, like, do I need real dice? And I mean, again, I've spent so much money on dice. I love holding dice. I love immortalizing my commitment to my hobby through collecting that stuff. Uh but as somebody, as I said, who has a like a learning disability, it's really hard for me, especially when I'm running a game, to keep it moving. Because we talked also about pacing. Sometimes I gotta roll digitally just to keep it moving. Um, and I've learned that that's just uh, that's just something I need to do sometimes, especially during the pandemic. My ability to cognate my way through some of that shit, then I just get anxious about like, oh my God, I'm holding up the whole game, even when I'm just playing, right? I'm holding up the whole game because I can't add my rage dice to my this dice. I can't do it. Oh God, I'm freaking out. Like I, or I, or I lost count. Like, oh no, my smites, like, what am I doing? You know? And then I start freaking out and panicking, which is so not necessary, <laughs> but I can't help it. It's what I'm built to do. So um I have less of, I, I won't say I'm judging you. I have less judgment about those who need that stuff. Sure. Cause I think there's a time and a place and it's allowed me to continue my enjoyment of the hobby 
at a time when I might as I might have just been like, I can't do this right now. And it's something that I get so much out of, as you know, because I've built so much of my life around it. Yeah, see, for me, I, I think really what it boils down to is the totem. Mm. I, I love having the books, even though I have good, solid, searchable PDFs and things yeah. that I can look at. I like having the book, not just because it can go to the toilet totally. conveniently, but because I I have the thing. With dice, it's it's the ritual of, of picking up this sacred randomization device. And and, mm-hmm. and and you know, whether it whether it's meditation or prayer, the hoping that you get a good number, you know what I mean? I can't do this digitally. I, I can't even this, you're remarkably charismatic and an amazing mm-hmm. conversationalist, and I just want to be doing this face to face. I totally hear that. And, you know, again, it's, it's six to one, half a dozen. I, you know, I've gotten to a place where I understand that some of this technology, like my best friend is the, uh, the director of licensing at Roll20. Like I use Roll20. I love Roll20. It's no substitute for the, you know, intrinsic feeling of being in front of a person, but it can get you a lot of the way there if you're willing to put in, put in the time and just accept that, yes, this is different. This is a different experience. Right. But I think we all long for the time where we can be at a table together and to have, to go to conventions and have these conversations in person. Like, I don't think I would never judge you for feeling that way. I think that's really a very real and relatable feeling that a lot of people have. I have two more questions that I want to ask you. Is there anything that I haven't asked you that you wish I would have asked? Or let me, so let me, let me ask you the second question then because maybe mm-hmm. it'll help with just with phrasing. Is there something that is important, obviously, besides plugging all of your stuff, which there's yeah. a lot, um, <laughs> is there something that you want to talk about, gaming-related, whether it's personally, professionally, you know, essentially, there's not a whole lot that I can do, but here I have, I have this forum, I don't have huge listenership, but I have some listeners, and yeah. I, I want to give you the opportunity to talk about what's important to you. I think something that content creators in this space don't think about enough is where is my place in this? Like why, why is what I have to say different than anything else? And uh, a lot of times, you know, I think especially for people who are in the position of being a, a white males uh, are, you know, they're like, Oh great. Well, I want to make something, but, there are just so many other podcasts that are just like a white guy sharing their feeling about C and D or, you know, you have to figure out what your way is in that you feel that you have. And to say that, you know, well, I'm not unique because there are a lot of other white guys doing this. or I'm not unique. I'm not unique because there are a lot of other girls like me with purple hair doing this. Like that is discounting the fact that people are more than the sum of their parts. If you have something special to say, you should focus on the best way to say it. And you're going to spend a lot of time making content that no one pays attention to for a really long time until you figure out what that thing is and it's going to start catching people. I mean, a really, a really good example, uh, is how Mike got in contact with me today. Like <laughs> you, I mean, you obviously didn't get in contact with me today, but, uh, you know, until I figured out that I could be the effervescent, like professional fan of things who wants to talk about like the real emotional weight of D and D. Like that's kind of my thing now. And that's when my videos started taking off and videos that I made a month ago that flopped, like suddenly started getting views. The algorithm started picking them up because they were like highly searchable. Like I did a video on the encounter builder for D and D beyond, which nobody has really made a video for. Um, so that I guess my, my only advice to people who are thinking about, you know, being a voice in this industry is you have to want to work hard and you have to want to meet people. I, uh, people ask me all the time, well, how do you get games in front of people? Cause I've worked as, you know, a designer on a couple of different titles and I've, I've written some, uh, 5e rule sets for, uh, game, like different to third party things that haven't been released yet. And people are like, how do you get those jobs? And I'm like talking to people when I feel like shit and don't want to. That is the only difference between me and you is that 
I started to realize that I wasn't just a fan, that I could be a professional and that I should go ahead and just stuff my anxiety deep down inside and say, I have to figure out a way to be present here and, and meet people and speak to them because yes, uh, networking sucks, but it is about who you know and it's about making sure that people know what you're doing. And you can't just go up to somebody and be like, I like games. Can I have a job? But if you go up and say, I like games and I've been consistently making weekly YouTube content about these aspects of Dungeons and Dragons. And, you know, I've had this much growth over the last year. So while I don't have a thousand subscribers yet, like it's something that I'm working towards, you know, I expect to in the next six months based on all the everything that the metrics tell me. That's someone that they're like, oh, wow, this person is actually like they have a mind for marketing and analytics. Like they're actually thinking really intelligently about this. And that's a lot of times how you get in the door in the game industry. Because spoilers, nobody in the game industry knows what they're doing either. Uh, but if you seem like you've, you've thought about things intelligently and aside from just doing what everybody else does, which is saying, I like games. How can I work in games? You'll stand out. Yeah, see. That and making cosplay that people like. <laughs> that's how I did it. Yeah, you're, but see, I'm, Ann Richmond, you're my fucking hero. You're amazing. You really, really are. Because you and I both, it sounds like, suffer from some mental issues. I, I'm a pretty mm-hmm. depressed person, and I, it, I mean, fuck, just getting out of bed. I mean, there, there are days. It's hard. Yeah, there are days where, and it sounds, it sounds like melodramatic, but there are days where you're just, fuck, man, it's all I can do to not eat a bullet. And I just, you used to, to keep going. I, I don't care what it is. I think that you will be successful regardless of what ende- what endeavor you set your mind to. I congratulations on the new job. I hope you quit it. Thanks. I I hope that you do uh gaming content creation full time. I I think I think you're remarkable and I think that people should follow you. Uh can you list off for us the multitude of places where you yeah, may be followed? Of course. Absolutely. Um, I am on Twitter at at Ann Richmond. That's Ann with an E, just like Ann of Green Gables. Uh, so at Ann Richmond on Twitter, at Hearth Singer on Instagram. You can follow me on Twitch where I am doing basically a, a variety of tabletop themed content on Tuesdays, Thursdays and Fridays. Uh, right now on Tuesdays, we're exploring Baldur's Gate 3. We've been doing a couple different playthroughs. Sometimes we'll be like, we're going to kill everybody and see what happens. Uh, right now we're doing Double Druid playthrough, which is super fun. Uh, and on Thursdays, I have been doing a show that I call Investigation Check, where I will read aloud from a book uh, and discuss it. So kind of like a, a book club with my, with my viewers. Um, this coming week, I'm going to be reading Neil Gaiman's Norse Mythology. And uh, I have a friend from over at Hunter's Entertainment, Caleb, uh, at Caleb is Drawing on, on Twitter, who is the uh, the art director over there um, and has done games like Gods of Metal Ragnarok, is going to come and draw Norse mythology-themed uh, doodles while I read. So that'll be really fun. And then on Fridays at 6 p.m. Eastern, every Friday, we gather around the heart for a podcast that I record the video for. During that Twitch stream, we cover a variety. It's like a tabletop RPG talk show. Very, very similar conversations to this one. So if you enjoy what Mike is doing here, you'll probably enjoy that too. We have a variety of guests on to talk about various things. Uh, and then it is exclusively uh, done in audio format for my patrons. Uh, and you can find my Patreon, which just supports all the content I make, both on YouTube weekly, uh, which is youtube.com slash Ann Richmond, where I do a new video every week on tabletop content uh and then the patreon is patreon.com slash hearthsinger games so that is where you can get access to audio only podcasts you can join um an awesome community of people who love talking about workshopping everything to do with running all sorts of different systems in tabletop games you can get access to join my exclusive patron only mmo style tables for the sunlit seekers campaign that where that i spoke about earlier uh, and you get access to join events where we do stuff like play Jackbox games and uh, watch Indiana Jones. And <laughs> we've also watched things like Labyrinth and Princess Bride and just like done big talkbacks about them afterwards. So it's a great, great community to be a part of. And I hope you'll come and join me. 
One last question. May may I put yeah. you on the spot? Yeah. Could you sing like a goodbye, farewell, Auf Wiedersehen, adieu, or <laughs> whatever whatever show tune of your preference that just to kind sure. of sign us kind of sign us out? Um. Okay. Yeah. This is more of an invitation uh, to come along with me on my adventures. Oh, the summertime is coming. And the trees are sweetly blooming, and the wild mountain thyme grows around the blooming heather. Will you go, lassie, go? And we'll all go together where the wild mountain thyme grows around the blooming heather. Will you go, lassie, go? Oh, that was amazing. <laughs> Ann Richmond, thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a true pleasure to sit down and chat with you. Why We Game is a production of the Influence Foundation. All rights reserved. Audio editing by Brodor. Music by Owen Godwin.